Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today, I'm delighted to be joined from Salt Lake City by Paul Butterfield. How are you doing, Paul? Doing great. How are you, John? Yeah, very, very good. And Paul is the executive board president of what is now the Revenue Enablement Society, formerly Sales Enablement Society, and we'll actually get into why that changed. Uh, he produces and hosts the podcast stories from the trenches as a regular keynote speaker and revenue on revenue enablement strategies and sales methodologies designed and built and led high impact revenue enablement strategies for teams like Vonage, GE, uh, nice in contact and in structure. Any coach go to market leaders from Expedia, ABB, Aspen Media, Orbitz, Red Ring Shoes. And prior to your career, you led channel and direct sales organizations for world class companies, including Intuit, Microsoft, and HP. So, um, what we're going to talk about today is mm -hmm. the customer customer journey enablement, and maybe as part of that, Paul. Just talk us through why Sales Enablement Society has become the Revenue Enablement Society, because I think that's a really good uh, jumping off point. Yeah, great. No problem. So as you as you mentioned, most of my career was spent either carrying a bag or leading sales teams. And the enablement part of my career, something I never saw coming, and it happened relatively later, about 11 years ago. And so... When I was first asked by my VP of sales to go take what I was doing for my AEs and scale that for his entire organization, that was my introduction to, at the time, it was called sales enablement. What I, and, and that's how most organizations were looking at it. How are we training? How are we equipping the sales team to go to market more effectively? What I learned very quickly, even in that first role, was that and I knew this from being a leader and selling our product alongside, we did not have a great handoff to services. We did not have a great handoff to customer success. The people that my team might've been selling to were very, not very often the same people that the customer success team needed to build a relationship with and work. And so there was a lot of knowledge gained in the sales process that was being lost and that sort of thing. So it got me thinking, even in those early days, what do we do to enable these other teams that are part of that journey that process that a prospect and a customer is going through. And so after I got the core sales teams taken care of, as I'd been asked, I approached our COO, started talking to him about how we could bring in some of these other folks, teach them the methodology, teach them this customer centric approach that we had developed and were implementing for sales. So I thought for a long time, that was just my personal journey. And sometimes when you're, when you're new at something, you don't know what you don't know. Right. It just made sense to me to include these other teams. Well, as I then was recruited away to GE and Vonage and was doing this same thing, I became aware of the wider enablement community. I became more active in things like, at the time, SES, and realized that I wasn't the only one doing that. And it was a growing trend. Forrester, Gartner, others were tracking this. And so fast forward in my time on the board at, at uh, RES now, we got together for a strategic offsite last year. And while we were looking at what our, pro, our profiles and um, priorities should be for this year, we, this is where this idea of rebranding came up because it was an acknowledgement of what so many of us had seen happening in the field. It was an acknowledgement of what, again, the, the analysts were seeing happening as a macro trend. There's still a lot of companies that aren't really doing that point to point enablement. I think there's a lot of opportunity mm -hmm. there to educate and help them do that, but that's that's where we ended up as Revenue Enabling Society. It's just more um, indicative of the kind of work yeah. that's being done in many cases. And I, th and I think one of the key things there, uh, Paul, at the, at the very outset is that idea of the journey. And I think that's mm -hmm. something that, uh, you know, in prior, in, in, in prior uh, times, you know, demarcation was always the key, like good fences make mm -hmm. good neighbors and all that good stuff, right? Yeah. And, you know, I have a very defined, say, if I'm in marketing, I have a very defined role. Then I throw it over the wall to sales, then sales right. throw it over the wall to implementation and then customer support afterwards. And everybody liked to live in these kind of silos and it was kind of neat. Mm -hmm. But the customer blew all that up and the customer right. doesn't recognize our boundaries. They don't recognize our demarcations. They're on a journey. And as you said, once upon a time, we tried to say, well, the, you know, let's say it's a sales process and everything we should be focused on. 
but really it's the customer journey and the customer journey mm -hmm. does not respect the boundaries that we tried to no. set up. And, and they could care, couldn't care less about our sales process. Uh, mm -hmm. But yet we talk too often about, you know, where are they in our sales process? They're not. Mm -hmm. The, I, I, so I love that you mentioned, you know, that alignment with sales and marketing. Here's a, here's an example that I see a lot of clients I work with. I've seen the businesses where I have built these things. And that is we want to teach our sellers how to talk to prospects at a business level, how to talk to them about outcomes, how to talk to them about, you know, what are the challenges they're facing? Um, what are the impact, most importantly, of those challenges? What's the future state they're trying to get to? What's the potential financial impact of achieving that future state? This is what discovery should be about. It shouldn't be about pitch decks, much less a demo. And it really shouldn't be about features. So the challenge is, if we're trying to teach sellers how to have or hold these elevated discovery sessions with, with clients, but all the training they're receiving from product marketing, all the ways that we're talking about the product on the website are feature-based, that's a huge disconnect that makes that transition much more difficult for sellers to make. So that's just, that's just one example of where I've yeah. seen getting that alignment really makes for a better customer. Yeah, no, I, 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 totally, I totally agree with you because that's where, you know, everybody needs to be business focused. So you're hundred mm -hmm. percent correct that if you're in marketing or product marketing, uh, you know, the features, the clicks and what the feature does. Yeah. Obviously people need to know that from a functional point of view, but in order to be able to sell it, you need the business use cases. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, this feature or this service sounds great. But what does it do? What does it do right. for my for my prospects? Like, how is it going to help them with their business outcomes? And that's an and that's I think has been a bit of a challenge for marketing groups to, and product marketing to start looking at things from a, a business use case perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when enablement when an enablement leader and enablement team are built and functioning optimally, they become a nexus for things like marketing, product marketing. Um, RevOps, where all of that's coming together and working in partnership with those folks, what enablement is really doing is packaging or synthesizing this stuff and then taking it that last mile to the sales teams or the CS teams uh, and the others that, that we're supporting. But that's ideally how that should be working together. And that's how you also avoid the silos you refer to. Mm -hmm. So how do you go, I mean, in, in order, I mean, because it sounds great, but how do you, uh, when you um, when you advise people or you work with companies, how do you help them with that piece? Because, you know, collaboration is still a hard thing. People still, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, people still want to have that sense of control over mm -hmm. their piece or, or even control over the whole lot. And, and this idea of kind of working in a more fluid and matrixed uh, way and contributing to the whole as a point, uh, the whole and the, the outcome as, a, as opposed to just contributing to my piece, that's a whole mindset change that's needed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, whether I'm coming in, whether I'm in there as a VP, uh, working full time, if I'm coming in to consult, irregardless, it starts at the top. If there's not a commitment, and that may be a, a chief sales officer, maybe a CRO, maybe an EVP of sales, but if, if there's not a commitment from that top revenue leader that this is a change that we want to make and this is why we want to offer different customer experience, there's not a lot. It's very difficult, at least, for me to be able to do that. So that executive sponsorship is critical. But when we have that, Bringing together the right, again, it might be RevOps, marketing, sales leaders, and workshopping through so that everybody's getting some input on, if we have ICPs, if that's been defined, what do we know about them? Why are they typically coming and buying our product or service? What problems are they solving for? Different companies I've worked with um, are different levels of maturity on this. I've worked with some clients where they really haven't developed personas or ICPs. And so we need to start with that. They have that in other cases, but they haven't really thought how to translate that into language and, and, and um, outbound messaging and such the sales teams can use. But regardless of where they are with that executive commitment, bringing everybody together, getting that agreement, this is what we want to offer our customers, and then figuring out where to work together to do it. Not saying it always goes perfectly, but I have found these companies I've worked with that people do recognize um, that the customer is, you know, customer. I mean, they're it, and 
we'll, we'll, we'll put aside our barriers, if you will, and let's figure out how to do this together. Yeah, because the other thing is, and, and as I said, going back to the the concept of the journey, because I think that's the it, that's the critical piece is that you know from a customer perspective, mm -hmm. uh, if you don't, it's like that. It's like that uh, saying, you know, your a chain's only as good as its weakest link, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if mm -hmm. you think of, and I often use this example, if you think of, you can go on a on a plane journey, you can go on a long haul flight, get to the airport smoothly, get checked in smoothly, everything you board on time, the flight's great, arrives on time, maybe arrives a couple of minutes early, everything has been smooth, and then your luggage is delayed and there's no information given to you. And, mm -hmm. and maybe it's only half an hour. When somebody asks you, how was the journey? You go, terrible. Even yeah. though actually, no, it wasn't. It was one tiny part of it. But that's how right. we're hardwired as humans. So if you think of a customer journey, if there's any weak link or any any uh, diminishment of your experience, whether it's at the, the front end, the sale, the marketing, the sales mm -hmm. part, the customer service, the customer success, you default to that. So you have to. You have to always be looking at that journey and whether it is optimized at every stage. Yeah, so let's look at the other end of it. So you, you mentioned that that, that customer success, those those um, yep. longer term relationships. Once sales is out of the picture, if we're doing a great selling um, methodology, we're offering a great experience. Again, we are uncovering critical business needs. We're uncovering what their objectives are. We, we should, what we need to be uncovering specific success metrics, because again, building a business case for why they're going to spend money and why they're going to invest in all this change management. If that doesn't go to customer success, that's a huge missed opportunity. In most organizations, customer success are the ones responsible for having quarterly business reviews, watching usage, making sure that customers are getting maximum usage out of what they paid for, and they can just do such a better job if we have found a way to transfer all of that knowledge from the sales process to them. So they can make sure that that's what's actually happening. And they can look like they actually communicate when they're speaking with, with those customers long term. So it, it's just as critical at the end, if you will, of the cycle as the beginning to, yeah. to keep that continuity. And I think part of what you just touched on there, part of it is is agreeing what what is what are healthy metrics for your customer because sometimes they pass it over to customer success and they'll say, well, everything seems to be fine. I don't see any support tickets. They seem to be good. Nothing's mm -hmm. and and then and then suddenly like there's an issue because nobody was communicating with the customer right. or whatever, and everybody was like, oh well, we thought no news was good news. Uh, but I think that's the thing is. We don't set up metrics, shared metrics that everybody agrees with it, that what constitutes a healthy customer mm -hmm. post sales. Mm -hmm. Right. I agree. There's a lot of opportunity there. And some of that's going to be informed by what we know internally mm -hmm. about past customers, current customers, that sort of thing. But so much of that should be getting uncovered in the sales process. And so to your point where, they, where we have the no news is good news mentality, if there are specific objectives that a piece of you know software or service has been purchased to accomplish, if CS knows that, they can and should be proactively probing to find out are those objectives being met. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, that's a great early warning system. And let's figure out why they're not being met and get a success plan in place to, to help with that. So it allows the CS teams to be more proactive. It allows them to uh, not be surprised as often if it's done correctly. And also, whether there's a separate renewals team or the CS team handles renewals, it's it's making that a must let excuse me a must much less awkward conversation because if you've been having these business conversations throughout, you've been establishing that the objectives they had in mind when they made the purchase were being met. Renewal doesn't feel like a sale uh, nearly mm -hmm. as much, and should be a better set. That should also be a better experience. Yeah, and because and one of the big challenges that uh, a lot of people are facing today, particularly if you're in technology sales, I would say, uh, is that uh, is this perception of you can swap out easy. It's easy. It's not like it used to be. You can swap from one provider to another, and you don't really have a relationship, you know. And the problem is, a lot of customers will stay very kind of hands off, and they'll they don't want that, you know. They'll resist that. So setting up those lines of communication is very and building a relationship is is harder than ever, but it's more critical than ever because obviously, if you don't have that relationship, so how do you how do you help in how do you what do you think about that situation where Customers are actually slightly resistant, 
if you like, to to building that relationship because they kind of feel that man, these things are all kind of swappable. That's why I feel when I think, let me back up a second. Yeah. When, when I think of enablement at the very highest level, what we're doing, we're enabling all of these teams that you and I are talking about to differentiate through exceptional experiences rather than trying to differentiate through features, mm. even worse, differentiate through discounting, horrible way to go. And, <laughs> and so we want to start showing these, these prospects from the beginning that this is a different experience. People won't always pay more for a better experience, but they often will. But the bigger opportunity that I see is so many sales teams are not working with their clients on building effective business cases. I, I don't know how to, I don't think I can even overemphasize this. If you can identify with them, what's the gap? What is not happening that should? What is the cost? What is the impact of that? That makes the whole deal a lot stickier from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And and that's 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 why that's just so critical. In fact, I would even say, you know, when I'm talking to salespeople, um, if you don't have a gap, if you don't have a goal that they can they can and will quantify with you, you don't have a deal. Walk away. What, what, are, what are you going to go sell? What are you going to build a case around um, for, for, for change and investment if you don't have those things? That is a very different experience. If you talk to, well, you probably do talk to a lot of folks that are mm -hmm. on buying and prospects and, and, and customers. That is not what they're experiencing very often. I get a ton of outreach every week from LinkedIn, from salespeople and BDRs, and I can pay for firsthand experience. 95% of it is still pretty terrible. And that's why I feel like, to, to go back to your question, that by offering a very different sort of buying experience, being business focused and helping set, frankly, them up to look like a hero internally, we're just, we're just differentiating in a lot of great ways. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that uh, nowadays that if you create, as you said, a different experience, it's surprising. It's more surprising to the mm -hmm. prospect slash customer than it should be, but it's indicative of the experiences that they're having that they're having elsewhere. So I, I totally agree with you on on creating the best experience. And the only way you can do that is to be constantly monitoring, because that's the other thing I think, uh, Paul. Is sometimes people think. Well, we've got our process, and you know, we 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 defined it a, a year or so ago, so it's probably good. Yeah, it's it's good. We're good for a couple of years. You're going, yeah, because mm -hmm. customers never change and they stay static. You're 100 on that. But this whole yeah. idea of constantly reviewing and tweaking and just realizing mm -hmm. that this is a dynamic relationship. It, it's true, and I'm glad you mentioned sales stages or process stages. What are most sales organizations basing those stages in Salesforce, HubSpot, whatever they're using? What are they basing those on? Usually a lot of internal yep. metrics or internal indicators. What about this? What about if we're teaching our salespeople to have these business level conversations? What are the predictable customer inputs that we should be seeing as an opportunity progresses? And what if those customer inputs became the actual gates? that indicated whether something is in stage one, two, three, et cetera, so that we're driving the opinion of the salesperson as much as possible out of that process. Mm -hmm. Again, it, it sounds kind of obvious, but it's not done really as often as it should. And that's another approach that, that I think people should, should consider. You have to have a good process. You have to have, excuse me, you have to have a good consistent methodology to be able to figure out, uh, you know, what those, what those inputs are for customers, but that's why it's important that it all goes together. And, your, your forecast will go up considerably if you're allowing the customer where your customer is. And this may sound like you're giving away control of the opportunity. My experience is actually not that way at all. It's just a different mindset and it's looking at your opportunity stages through their eyes, not grown. Yeah, no, no, and absolutely. And I would say, um, just Paul, in closing, the other part too is, is as you um, mentioned a number of times, it's really understanding the business outcomes of the customer. And you're not going to be able to do that unless you're curious, you ask questions, and then you listen and you mm -hmm. can probe and go deeper. And that seems mm -hmm. to be something that an art that people are losing because we're so distracted nowadays that the art of actually active listening and tuning in on what one person is saying as opposed to what your phone is saying or what your screen is saying or what something mm -hmm. else is saying. I mean, that seems to be almost a dying art. Yeah. Well, I would agree. But 
again, that means where there where there is uh, where there's lack of great experience, there's opportunity to go sell and, yeah. and by doing it differently. Yeah, so, yeah. The, the, the great news is if the bar is set low as it is today, right. you can. it's yeah. not that hard to exceed it and uh, to exceed it by a lot. Listen, thanks, Paul. This has been fascinating. And all of Paul's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, Paul, do tell people mm -hmm. a little bit more about what you do. Uh, so I, earlier this year, left my last uh, corporate gig at Instructure and founded Revenue Flywheel Group. I've been doing that kind of uh, sales effectiveness and process consulting on the side for some years, but I've always wanted to take it into a full-time thing because I love working with clients to analyze what's going on in the Rev org, help them problem solve, help them fix that. So that that's what we do. And, uh, yeah. and, and the name of the company speaks to how you and I've been talking, right? What is that revenue fly we're creating by aligning sometimes small things from top of the funnel through renewal in our enablement activities. And that's what I try to help clients do. Yeah, absolutely. Revenue flywheel. So go check it out. Could be the best investment you make. Let's go get that, uh, get that flywheel turning faster and faster. Listen, thanks again, Paul. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again soon.